Meet Leslie, a woman whose life took a drastic turn in her late 20s when she gained over 100 pounds for no apparent reason. Little did she know, her weight gain stemmed from a hidden medical condition, a reversible cause of obesity. So join me on this medical mystery as Leslie regains her health and her life. Leslie grew up in the United States, and like the rest of her family, she'd always been a bit heavier. But it wasn't until her late 20s that she really noticed her weight getting out of control. At first, she rationalized it, saying it was because of culinary school, and then because of her first pregnancy. But the weight just steadily piled on, until she could barely recognize herself when she looked in the mirror. It became pretty obvious that the weight gain was not due to either one of them, and it was getting so bad and coming on so fast that I was getting to a point that I did not recognize myself. I recognized my eyes, um, but the rest of me just, just looking so strange. I was starting to run into things, uh, doorways and countertops. Now I'm running into the wall. Now I'm knocking something off the counter. Uh, that was very strange to, to live through and to experience. Leslie withdrew into the home, rarely going out or socializing at all. She became increasingly anxious and irritable, and she was exhausted but she kept waking up at 3 a.m. every morning and couldn't get back to sleep. So she went to her family doctor. He noted her weight gain, found that she now had high blood pressure, and a blood test confirmed new diabetes. So things were really piling on at this point. So he prescribed the medic medicines for the, the diabetes and the blood pressure. He gave me a copy of the Mediterranean diet, but I could just tell, he could tell that there was something else going on. And he was a good partner as far as he could be. Um, he learned a lot, he was very curious, you know, throughout, but he just didn't didn't have the skill set, I guess, um, to, to get it right. It looked a lot like things he had seen, you know, he's seen a lot of diabetes, a lot of high blood pressure, and a lot of obesity, and so he attempted just to um, treat those things that he saw. One day, she developed such a splitting headache that she had to go to the emergency department, and she found out that her blood pressure was through the roof. All of a sudden had this horrible headache, one of the worst pains I had felt up to that point, and I'd had two kids at this point, so I'm like, my, my mind went wild with what it could have been. So I went to the ER. In triage, they, they noted that my, my blood pressure was extremely high. I want to say it was like 180 over 110 or 120. Oh, well, you've got hypertension. Oh, well, I mean, this is a hypertension migraine. Oh, it's just this, oh, well, you need to lose weight. <laughs> just, it just hurt so bad uh, in my head, you know, the pain, but also to uh, have the doctors just sort of, it's because of your weight. <laughs> then Leslie's skin started to change. She developed deep purple stretch marks all over her abdomen and severe cystic acne that she hadn't even had as a teenager. It became so bad that she went to her family doctor complaining of shoulder pain, only to find out that she had a severely infected skin abscess on the back of her shoulder. Next, to Leslie's horror, her hair started changing. First, her eyebrows became noticeably darker and bushier. And then she developed some dark hairs on the top of her lip for the first time ever. Her hair was thinning so fast that she became terrified to even brush it. Like so many of us, Leslie's long hair was part of her identity. And one of the last things that felt like her was disappearing quickly. And through all of this, Leslie's mood just plummeted. She became irritable, paranoid, and depressed. So unfortunately, with all these symptoms also came uh, pretty intense anger, more accurately categorized as rage sometimes. It's really a, a difficult balance because, you know, you want to isolate and you just want to kind of be by yourself. But at the same time, you don't want to be lonely and you don't want to be left by yourself. Of course, this was also the time that our best friend was getting married. So at the height of her weight gain, Leslie put on a bridesmaid's dress, hid her depression behind a big smile, and walked down the aisle. A few months later, one of Leslie's friends came to visit. So she parked, she got out of the car, she started to walk up to me, and then when we made eye contact, she just sort of stopped. And she was like, girl, what? Let's talk. And it turned out she just had thyroid cancer surgery. She still had a kind of a fresh scar and um, she had a friend that had PCOS who had just recently been diagnosed. She was convinced Leslie must have undiagnosed polycystic ovarian syndrome. That's what got it in my head, you know, need to go to the gynecologist. So Leslie made an appointment with a gynecologist who ran a whole bunch of tests and told her that she did not have PCOS, but that she was concerned she may have a different hormone problem. So my doctor called me when she got the test results and said, this is not PCOS 
this is something pointing to the brain, please immediately go and make an appointment with an endocrinologist. So Leslie was referred to an endocrinologist who ran more tests and confirmed that she had high cortisol levels. Now, cortisol is a hormone that plays a crucial role in your body's response to stress. It regulates your metabolism, immune response, blood pressure, and sleep. In other words, without cortisol, you would die. But on the other hand, high levels of cortisol over years can wreak havoc on your body and can ultimately be fatal. So like so many things in our body, it's a fine balance. Think of cortisol regulation like a thermostat for stress in your body. When stress levels rise, whether it's something scary like a loud noise or something more long-term like pressure at work, your brain releases a hormone called ACTH and that signals your adrenal glands to release cortisol. So then why is Leslie's body making too much cortisol? So there's usually two main reasons this could happen. Either her body is making way too much ACTH hormone, and usually that's because there's a tumor somewhere in the body doing that, or her adrenal glands are making way too much cortisol for some reason. So when Leslie's endocrinologist tested her ACTH level and found that it was really high, the hunt was on to find the tumor in her body that was releasing all this ACTH. And this was the MRI of Leslie's brain, which showed a tumor on her pituitary gland, right at the base of her brain. After some confirmatory testing, Leslie finally had a diagnosis. She has Cushing's disease, a condition where a brain tumor causes high cortisol levels and it explains all of her symptoms. One of the things I found when I was uh, searching uh, for information about Cushing's after I got my diagnosis was the Mayo Clinic's page. It's a, a basic info page about Cushing's, but there was a drawing of a person's body and it looked just like me. <laughs> um, come to find out a lot of patients come across that, it's a pretty popular page and they have that exact same response. That's me. Leslie's doctors explained that the next step was brain surgery. Remove the tumor, remove the problem. Sounds straightforward, right? Little did Leslie know that her treatment would be anything from straightforward. I definitely remember what it felt like. There's like the, the pre-op room where you, you change out of your clothes and you get into the gown and then you have to wait. Somebody comes in and puts the IV in your arm, you wait a little bit more, and then the door opens and there's a hustling, bustling movement while everyone's ready to go. You know, they've got the, the, the bed and they've got everything and you just stand up and you walk towards them and then you sit on the bed and you sit back and you start crying <laughs> and you look at your husband and you're both crying and it was just awful. It's cold. It's, it's just there. There's nothing you can do. It's almost like you're trapped. I hope I wake up. Please give me something right now to knock me out. You know, it's just like, please give me something. I, I don't want to feel this. And then, you know, before you know it, you're waking up. Because of the position of the pituitary, right between the eyes and behind the bridge of the nose, surgeons actually do this surgery by going through the nostril, drilling a hole at the back of the nose to get at the base of the skull. And that's actually how they remove a pituitary tumor. The surgeon hadn't made his rounds yet, so I hadn't talked to anybody that worked there. But my husband was like, good news, they got it. They got it all. Now I've heard it can take up to six weeks to recover and now I'm gonna you know, feel better, I'm gonna lose this weight. And then uh, not too long after that, the, the resident came through to talk about next steps because somehow my husband had misunderstood and I had not been cured. Um, in fact, I was still had really high cortisol and cruel trick. Um, I know he didn't mean to do that. I mean, there we were. I, I had not had a successful surgery and we had to talk about what to do next. So Leslie went back into surgery and this time the surgeon ended up removing her entire pituitary. Now keep in mind, your pituitary gland doesn't just control your cortisol levels. It also controls many other hormones that Leslie now has to replace with medications. It seemed like a reasonable trade-off if she was going to get better, but even after surgery, when her entire pituitary was removed, Leslie's cortisol levels kept rising. Leslie's doctors were stumped. Maybe they didn't get the whole tumor during surgery? In the end, they decided to let Leslie heal, monitor her cortisol levels, and then decide on the next step. So she went home and waited. I'll just say those were some really, some really dark days. I'm just not knowing what to do. It didn't make much sense that my cortisol continued to go up even without a pituitary gland. We kind of talked about some of the options, but I was just in kind of bad shape. I just had two significant surgeries 
and they just wanted me to kind of cool off a little bit before we figured out what to do next. Leslie had been warned that she'd probably feel congested and maybe have a runny nose. I mean, they had just cut a hole in the back of her nose, but she found that her nose was running a lot to the point that she couldn't lie down flat without fluid pouring down the back of her throat. Then she developed a headache and a stiff neck. So she went to the emergency department and waited all night to be seen. Maybe four or five in the morning, one of the neurosurgeons um, came through to check on me. He told me to sit up so he could listen to my lungs. And when I sat up, a bunch of the fluid squirted out of my nose and it, it was the middle of the night. I'm sure he was tired, but I just remember like the look on his face, like just, you just don't expect to see that. And he knew exactly what was going on. And so I was back in surgery within about an hour to close that leak. Leslie had a CSF leak. She was literally leaking spinal fluid out of her nose. And on top of that, she had meningitis. Bacteria had crawled up through that hole in her skull and infected her spinal fluid. That's why she had such a bad headache and a stiff neck. I mean, poor Leslie, she just can't seem to catch a break. Three months later, after she'd been treated with antibiotics for the infection, there was finally a glimmer of hope. One morning I woke up and I had slept all night and I wasn't hot and I didn't hear my heart trying to beat out of my body and a lot of these physical things that I've been feeling every single day for well over a year um, just seemed quiet. So she called up her doctor and they checked her cortisol level and to everyone's surprise, it was normal. So I kind of stayed in this kind of pseudo remission, feeling mostly better, but not all the way for about two, two and a half years. Two and a half years went by and it all started happening again. Leslie gained 30 pounds in one month. Her hair started falling out in clumps and her mental health took a dive. She went to such a dark place and she knew her Cushing's was back. Her doctors did another MRI and this time they found a shadow where the pituitary had been removed. Maybe there were some tumor cells left, but after two failed attempts, surgery was off the table. Instead, Leslie went for radiation therapy. 10 minutes of a beam aimed at her head every day for six weeks. Plus, she was also put on a medication that blocks cortisol. So the type of radiation I chose, uh, I go in and have a mask uh, fitted, um, especially to my face. And every day that I would go in for the radiation, it would, uh, I would lay down on the table and they would put the mask over my face and then latch it behind my head. And that just ensured that my head stayed very, very still because they were aiming a very small beam of radiation at my pituitary area. And it worked. It took another 18 months, but Leslie's cortisol levels were finally normal. Her symptoms melted away. And after 10 years, she was finally completely free of Cushing's disease. Now Leslie's become a strong advocate for those suffering with Cushing's. She's the president of the Cushing Support and Research Foundation, and she's on a mission to create community and peer support something she wished she'd had when she was first diagnosed. Um, I don't know why I didn't find CSRF. You know, I looked online, I looked at lots of things um, on the internet, but I just, I never found it. Um, and so I wish for something like that, um, just to have had that connection immediately. Sometimes we'll get a call from someone that just got the diagnosis or, or they're pretty sure they had it there in the testing. And I'm like, wow, like what if I could have, what if I had found it then? You know, and I could have made that phone call and just been supported through all the rest of it and had somebody to give me the good advice to know what really happens afterwards, you know, to what really to be prepared for. And I probably would have just tried to be even more gentle with myself, to not push myself to try to, you know, make up for what felt like a huge failure. You know, I couldn't be a mom. I couldn't be what I needed, you know, what I had already, the roles that I had always played for my family. Just couldn't be that anymore. And it felt really terrible. It felt like a loss of identity, but I just, I just wish I hadn't carried all that burden at the time. I wish I could have had more of a, just a, a free communication with the people I loved and lived with. So I want to give a huge thank you to Leslie for sharing her story with us and for the terrific work she's doing. So if you like this video, you might want to check out this one next. Chris had hiccups for three years before doctors figured out the trigger. Be sure to subscribe and that way I'll see you in the next video. So bye for now.